Today I'm talking to Paul Flowers, Chief Design Officer of Lixel Water Technology, of which Grower, founder partner of WAF, is an important element. And we're talking about the relationship between product development, product technology, and the way that humans behave. And this is really in the context of WAF's overarching conference theme this year, which is housing for everyone. And of course, uh, many grower products have an intimate relationship in more than one sense um, to the way we live today. Uh, Paul, how can design and designers uh, using today's extraordinary products and technologies and materials make things user-friendly for simple human beings? Well, I guess um, with all the technology available to designers, of course, um, it's, it would be very easy to make things overcomplicated and to get carried away with all the things and opportunities we have and things we could do. Um, I think at the end of the day, we still have to go at the pace of human beings. Um, and that's, that's the interesting thing about trends. If you look at trends, how you predict trends and cycles, if you're too early, of course, it's not good. If you're too late, you've missed a trend. So it's really all about timing. It's about context, of course, and it's about relevance. So what we do, we, we try to ascertain and, and gather as much information about consumers, what they're using, their desires, at this particular moment in time, and try to anticipate what's going to be relevant in the coming years. And then we, through research, of course, and through our experience with products and, and creating experiences, we then work really hard to ensure the products that we make are human focused. They're really answering some very simple, basic needs that we have. They really, let's say, deliver benefits to the consumer to the process of use. And we try to do that in a way which is, which is unique, fun, often fun, engaging, but really human focused, human centric. And I suppose the, the, the big fundamental change um, in, in one of the big parts of your world, the world of sinks, taps, showers, lavatories, is that we've moved from the 19th century condition where the big change was provision, consistent provision, um, to a 21st century situation where because of technology now it's about how we use and to what extent we can exploit that provision? I think so. I mean, yeah, we definitely went through this whole uh, trend of lifestyle multiplier. So people had access, you know, to sanitation and the bathroom and all these great products. And you're right now, people are, are careful and, and they're very aware of the resources that we're using. So we're seeing a next generation of products come through. And let's be honest, the bathroom is, relatively speaking, has been slow on the uptake of some of these technologies. And, you know, we've been pushing digital since 2008 with Ondas, uh, a full digital range that we launched then. And, uh, and now I see with digital coming through, it's going to allow people to consume less water, have more uh, tailored experiences, and it's going to develop experiences in different ways and take away some of those things that, that we still haven't resolved. You know, water temperature, flow, um, consistency. When I move from one environment to the next, why do I have to start from scratch? Why, when I go to a hotel, um, isn't everything so intuitive that it really understands me and my desires? Why do I have to constantly have to be, you know, in charge of, of let's say, of that experience? Why can't the products be more intelligent? All the technologies that we introduce, they're going to start to add that element of intelligence. They're going to add that element of convenience that, that hasn't been there before, to be honest. But like I said, but really has to come in a human way. One of our values is human. I mean, Grow, they have easy, human, and performance. And we really had that human element for 10 years in there because we really wanted to remind ourselves that everything we do, again, it's, it's for people, it's for human beings has to add value. So that's why we have human in there as a value. Because it's a curiosity in a way that the, the era of mass production, one might have thought, well, in that case, everything would be the same everywhere. But in fact, it hasn't turned out like that. Um, you get mass production um, in one place or for one organization. In fact, a whole series of different mass productions which are different everywhere, especially across uh, uh, national boundaries. And I suppose, that one of the opportunities that you have, especially using digital technology, is try to almost bypass the fact that mass production is always going to be with us because it's individual use rather, or individual 
control um, rather than the method of production, which is, is more important. Yeah, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, everything that we do, it kind of, it all, let's say, comes to an end point. And the end point has to be that human point of interaction. And that's where it's a very personal thing. Um, and of course, if you think of something like the bathroom environment, the kitchen, I mean, they're quite intimate spaces. You know, they often say there are two touch points for a brand. You know, it's kind of the beginning when you're buying something and, and that whole interaction. And then actually the most important, which is the intimate one, which is when you take a product home, because you, you no longer have all the brand stuff around it and communication. It's really down then to the product, the technology, the quality, all of those elements interfacing directly with a human being. And, and then I think that's when it's, um, it's very, very unique, very important that you have that flexibility. Technology allows that, let's say, to make consumers, even in a mass-produced product, feel like it's like slightly individual and understands their personal needs. We all have slightly different needs, and the technology is going to allow that, that kind of concept of personalization. We're doing it now through production, with new production techniques, 3D printing is coming in. I mean, uh, one of the brands in our portfolio we launched last year for the first time, a 3D printed commercial faucet. Now, we're still a way off really that becoming mainstream, 3D printing a few years off. Um, it's rapidly changing, of course, but that will change the production uh, concept and how people individualize things. And that's all the physical stuff, new materials. At the World Architecture Festival this year, we're going to launch a number of new materials on our products, which again allow for this concept of mass customization. But the, the technology is coming through, that's where you're going to really be able to personalize the experience. And we've seen that with telephones, of course. You know, it used to be the physicality of the object. It used to be what shape was your telephone and in the old days of Nokia, etc. But now it's become all content-based. You, you individualize that through applications, uh, through images, through the graphical layout, the interface. And that's the porthole that you really have the relationship with. Now, that technology has to come into the bathroom, of course, and it is coming in. I suppose one of the... Uh, one of the emotional relationships that people have is the point where replacement is required. Now, in your industry, where the products are pretty long-lasting, I mean, people don't expect to, to change a sink and tax, possibly uh, for a lifetime. They might do for, for style reasons or, or if they move home. Can you uh, build in a sort of triggers so that if replacement is required, that it's you that they turn to and not somebody else? Well, I guess, I, I think it's like anything else. I think those triggers are, of course, our, our loyalty uh, to a brand, and that brand loyalty comes through the experience you have. So uh, the triggers often are emotional triggers, I think. You, form, you tend to form a relationship with a, a product or service from a company. And if that's a, like any relationship, if it's an emotional thing, and if that's positive, then why would you change or, or let's say have a different relationship with anyone else? So you're almost starting at a good point, let's say. And then it's up to you at that moment in time when people are changing over to things, you know, are you current? Are you readily available? You know, are you, let's say, have you progressed, let's say, with that particular consumer's needs? So that's why I think um, there are triggers that you can build in. Some products we have, um, like for example, Blue, which is a, a faucet, which um, still, it, it produces still water, carbonated water. It's chilled, it's uh, filtered. It's a really amazing product. And then of course, you have a long relationship with consumers because they're um, reordering um, filters and, and the, the carbon and stuff. So some of our products, we actually have, let's say, uh, a much more frequent relationship, not just the once in a lifetime relationship you're talking about. We have uh, spa collections like candles and things we introduced into the grower brand to have that frequency of relationship. Um, and so I think all of those things, that brand, let's say, um, involvement, that tends to keep you top of mind with the consumer. And presumably sometimes it can be self-triggering in the sense that um, your app will tell you actually it's time for you to order a new whatever it is, press here. Yeah, 
I think that's the thing. I mean, we're trying to we're trying to take away all of those human elements that people don't like. People don't like to have to keep remembering to do stuff. So, for example, with blue, if you need to reorder the, the filter, you don't want to have to reorder the filter when it's run out. And that's really inconvenient. It would be good to know beforehand. And then to take away that whole process, the consumers could just say, do you want to order the, the filter? Yes, I do. I'd like to replace that order. So we're trying to look at all of those those interaction elements to make it easier just to replenish what they need uh, in a good way. But of course, that comes with everything, with spare parts. If consumers need to get access to something, you have to have all that stuff readily available, easy to install. Um, yeah, so I guess it's, it's, uh, it's all linked in a way. I wanted to ask you about this concept of total design, um, which is, is sort of not just, let's say, um, if, if you're designing hotel rooms, it's not enough to design the room. You need to design, um, well, how did people find out about the hotel? How did they order that room? You know, how is it programmed for their use right through to um, what's the follow-up after they've experienced that room? Now, in the world of product design, I suppose your equivalent of that is this thing about when you take a product home, and I wonder to what extent it's now assumed that I know Grower do, that actually the, the packaging, the instructions, yeah. the assembly, um, in a sense, are as much part of the design process as the product itself. And I wonder whether in, in your life as a designer, whether you've seen changes to sort of embrace that idea that it's not just a product. Um, I would say massively so. so if you look at the, how people interface to your brand, um, there are so many different interfaces. Like you say correctly, one of them is installation, purchasing, research, all of those aspects. If you have a control over all those facets, of course, um, you can have a better brand experience or a more controlled brand experience. You can ensure the messaging is correct. People are getting all the information they need. Um, and, and so we do. We spend a lot of time, not just as a, as a let's say, a product design uh, group, not just designing the physical product, but also understanding, okay, so how is this installed? So we send our team out to work with installers, plumbers, really understanding and gaining insights, you know, how could we improve that aspect of the product? Because they specify our products, they're important. Then, of course, consumers. So once it's been installed, you know, how does the consumer interact with that product at different times during their use cycle? You know, you're shampooing your hair, you're enjoying the water when you're not actually, let's say, in the active stage of cleaning, you're enjoying the water. What, how can we change that experience? Uh, and that's leading to massive insights, even through to logistics. So at the beginning, we designed products, which, you know, our products used to be at 43 degrees, all our shower heads, we flattened those up to seven. We reduced the packaging by 50%, reduced the carbon footprint by about 47%. Uh, we fit twice as many products on, on ships and aeroplanes and trucks. So just that one insight reduces the whole logistical concept. It means even when the consumer unwraps it at home, there's half the packaging to deal with. That has a knock-on effect on, the, on their recycling at the end of the, of the week and all those other things. There's so many facets of the, let's say, the user interaction with that brand. It's immensely important. And then you come down to, of course, the intuitive nature. That's why one of the grow values, like I said, is easy. So we have easy human performance. The easy part is all about, we have to make it intuitive. When a consumer walks into a hotel room, so in the, let's say in the domestic at home, it's, it's easy because you're used to using a product. But we try to do stuff that when you walk into a hotel room, you know how to use that product. It's easy, it's intuitive. Yes, that endless decision about whether the tap lever goes up, down, left or right, <laughs> or if it's very old-fashioned, sort of screws around. Yes. Um, there's a, there's a, an interesting aspect to, to what you've done in, in your work at, at Grower and for Lixel, which is very much based on research into how people actually behave. I mean, I remember when you were designing a new showerhead range that you did exhaustive studies um, of actually how people shower, what they do in the shower, probably some X-rated filming there, but, um, but the, 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 that research showed that actually contrary to popular belief that 
you know, there was more than one way to design a shower head. There was more way than one way to think about how mm. people actually wanted water on their hair or not on their hair. Mm. And I wonder whether um, those sorts of researches, especially uh, in the field of laboratories, without going to gigantic, uh, intimate detail, but I wonder how much scope there is for actually looking at that part of the bathroom experience, which, relatively speaking, hasn't really changed very much. No, and, and I think, um, you know, we're about to see in, in Europe, at least, um, a revolution in, in what's going to happen around the, the toilet, the WC. Uh, we're going to start to see technologies come in. Technologies that, that are readily available in parts of Asia. Japan's a great example. Um, toilets which, which do amazing things. And actually, if you put them in the context of the bathroom um, as a, and then you look at the kitchen, uh, the kitchen with all the new extractors that they have, which allowed us to have open plan spaces. Now we go back to the WC and all of a sudden we have odor absorption coming. We have things to mask sound. We have technologies um, which, we, which we apply to our ceramics so nothing sticks to them. So it's all about hygiene and care. Um, you know, we have all these elements then, you know, self-opening and closing lids and, and night lights so it's gentle on your eyes and, you know, all of these human aspects now coming into, into a WC, technologies coming in which are going to transform how you use this product. Of course, I, I spend lots of time, I'm in Japan almost once every month in, in Tokyo, etc. And, uh, and when you get used to using these products, it, they're absolutely amazing. They're transformational uh, in terms of hygiene, in terms of the consumer experience. We're going to see that stuff coming in more and more into Europe now and, uh, and starting to add, like I said, some technologies which add value to the human process. Uh, and they're going to go way beyond this stuff because once we get to that stage, of course, then we start to look at diagnostics and the information that vessel extracts. Yeah, I mean, this is an intriguing example of how, um, how research in general suddenly starts to branch out into things which, which have nothing to do with the original product, but mm -hmm. it involves the exploitation of knowledge and data. Yeah. And I suppose in, in what's happened with the bathroom in an environment where we increasingly, I suppose since the 1980s, and actually certainly in construction, one of the biggest changes was the move to handheld unit drills, the mobile phone, of course, which transformed the way that communications to, could take place in construction, apart yeah. from uh, in all other walks of life. But in the case of the bathroom, you don't want anything to be handheld, really, if yeah. you can avoid it, do you? You want it to be hands-free. And I suppose that's a sort of line of investigation about, you know, what, why, why do you ever have to touch a tap in the first place? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and again, this is a great, a great example where technology can really help. So, so we have, you know, an array of products because it's, it's really interesting when you look into the contact points in the bathroom and kitchen, by the way, um, how you transfer germs. Um, if you had an environment where you have a completely hands-free environment, uh, you could, let's say, you could negate that issue of, of the spreading of germs. However, we're human beings, we're tactile, we like to interact with things. So that's been our challenge. So, for example, in the kitchen, we've introduced products like Minter, where you initially we had products where you actually touched that with parts of your hand. So if you'd been chopping chicken or meats, you didn't want to contaminate the faucet in any way. You could just touch it with your elbow, a non-contaminated area, onto the faucet. It was capacitive and it would release the water. So you could wash your hands, then you could touch and do what you liked. That was really clever. We also then introduced products which you could control with your foot. So you could tap a capacitive plate, which we've launched, and, and then the water comes that way. And then, of course, we have the infrared faucets where they're proximity-based, that they come on automatically. We even looked at, I mean, I know in my, my own home, we have a, a grow product in my children's bathroom, which is, again, it's an infrared product, and it has its own dynamo. So it powers, with the water that's drawn through, it powers the actual electronic faucet itself. So my children, when they're brushing their teeth, the water only comes on when they put the toothbrush underneath. So it's really efficient and it even powers the electrics. So we have all those aspects of non-touch. And when you start to look at the environment itself, I mean, it's interesting when I talk to architects and interior designers in these spaces, because it's not just the toilet, which of course with these very, with the new toilets we have like Sensi Arena, 
where they're cleaning you and washing you and drying you, you're going to have less contact with germs. Uh, it doesn't matter because when you, let's say, exit that environment, you're still touching the faucet, you're touching the door handle, all those aspects. So, you know, we're look, working now with, with architects and designers to see how can you look at the entire concept. So not just the product that's clean, but when you leave that space, do you really have to touch the door handle? Do you really have to have this interaction anymore? We certainly have been able to negate with product collections um, that issue of hygiene. And presumably sensor technology, uh, although it's not directly your field, it's sensor technology which is allowing um, potentially so many of these things to happen, you know, the opening sliding yeah. door and, you know, the tap that starts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how do you keep tabs with other technologies and, and other development? Do you, do you have sort of... Uh, do you have advanced information about research or basically do you wait until things are tried and tested before you exploit it? No, I mean, so, so like I said, what we do is obviously we, we keep abreast of all the available technologies and, and what their relevance is to the kind of products we're creating. But we also have, of course, a huge engineering team and advanced, um, let's say, technology team that are exploring, developing technologies and also, of course, sourcing technologies externally and internally, um, uh, which may be relevant to solve a particular issue. So, for example, being part, Grower being part of the Lixor Water Technology Group um, gives Grower access to lots and lots of research of all the other brands and likewise. So, you can imagine the, the Japanese brands, Lixor Inax, they have amazing sensor technology because in Japan, it's very, very standard to have all of these sensing technologies. It's very developed, very stable, uh, very beneficial. Now you have, of course, the brands within the portfolio having access to that data, that information, that research, uh, and that technology. So it's really helping some of the brands bring in, I would say, uh, technology platforms, and like Grower, bring in technology platforms which are tried and tested let's say, in other countries where they're very standard, introducing them into, into areas like Europe and, uh, and then you know, having stable technologies which really drive a lot of value to the usage, the consumer usage. And a final question, amidst all this sophistication, one has to assume, um, certainly in my case, that the technology and the potential technology is far more sophisticated than the human beings who may be uh, <laughs> using it. Now, it's easy for you, you know how all this stuff works, but um, to what extent can you lead and to what extent do people want to be led in a world where actually the power of the app may give them infinite choices, yeah. however unsophisticated they may be? I think, look, at the end of the day, human beings, we all like choice. Sometimes we'd like to take advantage of that choice and sometimes we don't. So I think with anything, you almost have to have a very simple, intuitive version of stuff. But you also have to give consumers now the option, let's say, to personalize, individualize, and if you like, um, let's say, improve or at least create more options for themselves. We saw that in telephone technology, that's what became very, very popular. Consumers can have as many apps as they like and it can be as simple, as intuitive or as complex as they like. Um, and I think that's very much the case um, with the kind of products we produce. I think at the end of the day, people want to know how to use something intuitively. And, uh, and we have to, we spend so much time. Simplicity is probably ironically, the most difficult thing to install in a product because often they are very complicated. They have lots of different things coming together and moving parts and aqua engines and all these different bits of technology. The human interface, we have to just take away all that clutter noise so we can guide consumers through the technology, through the semantics and the design to get the most out of that product in an intuitive way. So yeah, we have to really, I think, be mindful of how complex things are, and then allow consumers to make them more complex if they would like to. Paul Flowers, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.